And I ask that you would release revelation to your people today concerning spiritual authority, concerning your governmental authority, Father. I just thank you, Lord God, that we have ears to hear and a heart to receive. And Father God, I ask that it would be clearly uh, brought, that revelation would be released, that you would speak a word through these lips of clay, Holy Spirit, a word that would strengthen, edify, encourage, a word that would build up the body today and those watching, Father. And we just thank you uh, for the impact partations even um father god i just thank you father for healing being released to bodies even as i teach today father i thank you for miracle signs and wonders being released in the name of jesus we just declare your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven in this place and to in those that are watching in their lives in jesus name amen so you notice even um you know even with praying when you're talking about, we're talking about apostolic function today. And so you notice it's always broader than us. Amen. And so let's first start with Hebrews 3, verse 1. It says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him. So Moses also was in all his house. And so if we want to know how, and I'm glad some of you got your notebooks good because there's going to be a lot of scriptures for you to write down. And so if you want to know what an apostle looks like, we got to look at Jesus, <laughs> right? Because Jesus is the apostle of our faith, okay? And so he's always going to be the model for us in everything. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came in the flesh, in the earth, he demonstrated the fivefold, okay? And then so we're going to pull out of some things about Christ, the apostle, all right? And so let's go to Ephesians 4. You know, it's something because, like I say, people visit and they come to cleansing classes on Mondays and and a lot of them, will, you know, they thought and they have spoken that um, they thought apostles were just for the, the, the Bible. You know, they don't even they don't even understand that they're still functioning in the in the earth today. And so, um, you know, that it's it's that way. And God is restoring um, the function. Well, you could say function. Some people say office. You know, he's restoring the gift. There's a lot of different ways you can say it. Not any of them are wrong, okay? And so he's restoring that back because the church was to be built on the apostles and prophets, right? And so if you note, and many of us come out of, I did, mainline denominations where all I ever knew growing up was a pastor, an evangelist, and a teacher, that was it. There was three that I was accustomed to that I uh, understood. But as far as I was taught, there were not apostles and uh, prophets today. Well, why would God change his mind? Okay, the word is forever ever settled in heaven. So let's go to Ephesians 4, verse 7. It says, put to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so I said a while ago, it is Christ the apostle today, okay? Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now the expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Now look what happened when Jesus descended, he ascended, and then it says that Jesus gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some as pastors, or you, it's interpreted shepherds and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man and the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. All right, then he goes on to say, as a result, so if we receive the function of Jesus, the apostle, the function of Jesus as a prophet, the function of Jesus as an evangelist, a teacher, 
okay, a shepherd, okay, it says that, that these gifts, these things were released into the earth, and we know they're released into what? People, right? They were put in us before the foundation of the world. He says until we are, so we can be equipped and be mature and come into a unity in the full knowledge of Jesus as a mature man. So that tells me, and we're going to go ahead and continue reading, but it tells me that I need the fivefold in my life as a believer to become mature and equipped to do the work of the kingdom and to get a revelation of Jesus. Amen. That should excite you. It excites me. In 14 it says, And as a result, we are no longer to be children. See, when all of that happens, then it says, As a result of that, receiving the gifts of God, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. He says, look, if we don't receive the gifts of God, the offices, the functions, the, the administration, okay, in the earth of God, he says we could be tossed to and fro. We could fall into false doctrine. Why? Because you've not received the teacher. The teacher is going to keep you line upon line, precept upon precept, right? Maybe you've not been shepherd. Some people think, I don't need no pastor in my life. And most in the body of many, I'm not going to say most, but I'm going to say many in the body of Christ, they're born again, but they do not have an apostle or a prophet in their life. They don't even think that they're real. I'm telling you, they will not grow into full maturity and be activated into the service of the kingdom of God in their full potential without them. Why? Because it is what? God's divine order for the church. Amen? That's why Jesus says that your traditions, what, make the word of God of none effect. Traditions of men nullify the word of God. So we don't want any of that. Amen. And so the dominating anointing, if you could say it like that, and I'm not saying control, I'm saying governing. That probably sounds better. The governing anointing in the book of Acts was the apostolic. Read it. Read about it. Read the book of Acts. And this, this month, um, I know I told you to be in Revelations, <laughs> and I hope you're all reading. Yeah. All right. Well, expand your Bible study to the book of Acts. Because we're talking about uh, the spiritual authority. So we need to see how they function, right? Because that is the birthing, the beginning of the church here. And so the book of Acts was an apostolic. Uh, the, the, main, um, the governing anointing was apostolic. The apostolic anointing governed what they did in the early church. And what was a result of Acts? Powerful move of God, right? There was a movement of the kingdom. There was an expansion. There was a breaking through because, or you could say, uh, governed by the apostles. Amen. God is still using this blueprint today. Okay. Now we can we can build our own models, and people do that. It, you know, we have denominations, right, all over, and every denomination has a set of guidelines, a set of rules, a set of uh, some kind of theology or, or the way they view scriptures, and they begin to build their, uh, build their denomination on certain things, right? There's some denominations that don't believe in healing. We know that. There's some that don't believe in, for sure, prophetic or apostles or deliverance. Some, do, some will tell you Christians can't have demons. Let's tell the truth, right? And some, will, some believe these things. What does that do? It's nullifying the word of God. Okay, and so we have to look at the examples that God gives us. So the word apostle, okay, the Greek word for that means delegate. It means an ambassador of the gospel. It means official commission of Christ. It's an official commissioning of Jesus, and it's, and it's supposed to carry with it miraculous power, and it also means a sent one or a missionary, Okay. So we know John 14, 26, everybody in here has Holy Spirit if you're born again. 
John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Holy Spirit is an apostolic spirit. He was sent by, by the Father into the earth. Amen. And guess what? He's inside of you. Hmm. And so as a believer, okay, we house Holy Spirit. We, we have the potential to operate in the abilities of God as he wills us to. Doesn't mean if you do miracles that you're an apostle, okay? You got to hear me. There's greater dimensions, greater glory should always be flowing out of God's people when, they're, when they receive the fullness of Jesus, and because, and it'll probably take me two weeks to teach on this, this one subject before we go on, because you have to understand that you're an apostolic company. Yeah, you are. It's, it's on you. And so when I'm teaching about what a mantle, what the mantle that an apostle carries, okay, you have to understand that it says that the anointing of God, what, flows down to you. Amen. Why? Because you're receiving it. You don't resist it because tradition says that apostles are not for today, especially women ones, right? You don't res you resist that because it's against doctrine, it's against the word. Because we know there's no male or female in the spirit. There's no Jew or Gentile, bond, slave, free, whatever. We're all what? One in the body. Okay, and so you've received it, and because you can receive it, and you're open for revelation, that revelation, like I taught, it comes into you, but it's also going out of you. <laughs> and you've had great breakthroughs in your life because you've received God's gift. Amen? Amen. Whether Whatever body suit it comes in here, because we have a lot of different body suits that come in here, that are apostles and prophets. Amen? And so I'm just, I'm just trying to give you the, the understanding. That's why you're receiving breakthrough. And so um, as a believer, you house Holy Spirit. So you have the potential. And so believers who operate in the fivefold have a greater dimension of Holy Spirit's anointing in the gift, okay, Gift or function or office, everybody uses those three terms there. You have a greater dimension of that in which they're called to function and operate in. So I could say, I want um, Joanne to, you know, to go out on the street and win souls and do the work of an evangelist, okay? Well, Joanne's more pastoral by nature. Now, she could go out and win souls, and I could commission her and lay hands on her and all those things, and she can receive an impartation, and she can go out and win souls. We all should be doing that anyway, right? But, you know, the grace, and then I could, and I could lay hands on, <laughs> um, I know Kathy's not here, but I feel like Kathy has evangelistic call in her life. You know, I could commission Kathy to go, and there's a greater dimension of grace inside of her to be a, a, what an evangelist, right? Doesn't mean they both can't do evangelistical work because we're supposed to do that. But there's a measure of grace that's been released to them to function, and we can do the work of an evangelist without being called to be an evangelist. You see why? Because I have Holy Spirit. Yeah, I can function and flow in and out. Now, it's important to identify if you are an evangelist, but that calling comes from God. And as you, as, as you feel the call of God, say, to evangelism, and you just know inside, like my sister Judy, she was an evangelist. She got the revelation, didn't she? And I tell you, when she got the revelation, it put her on fire. We all could see it, because everywhere she went, what was she doing? Winning souls. She wasn't too good about shepherding them <laughs> because she wanted them all to what? Get it together. You know, why can't you just get it together? You need, they need to grow up. I mean, she would tell me, they need to grow up, Jeanette. 
They need, you know, she would say all those things. Why? Because her temperament and her gift was what? Evangelism. She just wanted to go catch them. She just wanted to go pray for them at Walmart and get them healed in the aisle. Yeah. And then when they got in here, well, let's pass them off to Bertha. Pastor Bertha. She used to be like, Pastor Bertha can, and, you know, she's good at that, she would say. <laughs> so we laugh about it. But you need to understand, I want your eyes to be open to see something. You know, I can pray for people too, and I do that, and we do that out in public and do all those things, and you probably have too, but there's some that have a greater dimension of grace to function in an anointing or a calling from God. Does that mean God thinks they're special? No. It says when he, we're all special, okay? So when he ascended, he released those things in the earth to perfect the saints. And so I have to receive all of it in order to, to get a benefit from it. You know, I, I thought about uh, Jesus when he walked on the earth, you know. Many of them, and I think it was, P, yeah, it was Peter that said, and they said, who, who do you think I am? You're the son of God, right? And what did Peter receive from him? Everything he could get. And then you read more where, um, you know, Judas called him teacher, rabbi. That's sad. It, it, Judas never got the revelation, did he? I don't believe he did. And so when, when we identify the grace function in someone and we respect the grace function in them, guess what? We can begin to receive from them. See, I can't receive if a... If God would, you know, send a prophet in here and I'm like, well, I don't believe they're a prophet and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm, you know, judgmental or critical or I don't believe prophets exist today. That person can come and release a word to me. But my heart is like, whatever, I, I don't believe in prophets today. I'm, I'm going to miss a blessing. I'm going to miss what God has for me. And so thank God that we are people that are open to receive everything that the Lord has. And so... He said, each one of us, grace was given. The word grace means a divine influence upon the heart. Hmm. So God, each, each uh, a function or office, he give them a divine influence upon their heart. He gave them favor, also means favor, it means gift, upon their heart. It, it's actually the word they use for charisma. Right, So there's some zeal that goes when you find out who you are and your gifts that you have, no matter what gift it is, whether it's a function or just you know you have a strength in healing or a strength in exhortation or whatever that is. You know, when you get the revelation, you see that thing begin to uh, come out of you and, and Holy Spirit just begins to stir you up. And you're like, wow, I know who I am. There's a, there's a charisma. There's an excitement that comes when you know who you are, right? And you will be tested by God whenever you, not by God, by the enemy will, will test you, but you will be tested. God will allow the testing to come whenever you finally figure out who you are. Yeah. Why? Because the enemy doesn't want you to, to walk in it. Okay? He will always want you to resist who you really are. And so if you don't know who you really are, you will mimic and copycat other people because it looks like, well, that looks cool or that looks fun or that looks, I could do that. Not if you don't have the grace. Amen. You've got to have the grace to do that. And so in, so in the body of Christ, we have many people uh, shepherding that are teachers or shepherding you know, or maybe being uh, trying to be an apostle and they're a pastor, or maybe you have pastors that that don't that need to be crossing over into the apostolic. You see what I'm saying? But but they're they're controlled, you know, by a deacon board or something or some kind of thing. They're controlled by that and they're not allowed to function. And so we have to go back to what acts. We have to go back to that. That's why you need to get in there and see how they functioned. So God's helping us. So Jesus was the great apostle. So to identify the apostle gift, the authentic from the false, we have to look at his example, right? Because it says that there's many false, false prophets, false apostles. So there should be the virtue of the apostle Jesus present in their life. You should be able to see it. Number one, 
This, these are just my, this is what I, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me on the way here. Number one, authentic apostle, they are humble servants. Okay? That, to me, that's the number one thing. They're humble servants. And I know, you know, they have a relationship with Jesus. They have a love and a passion for Jesus. All right? But they're humble servants. And um, go to Matthew, Matthew 20. See, the, the, the old model of a uh, apostolic model, we've all seen many of them. If, if you've walked in the earth very long, you've seen different models because people will mimic or take on what they, what's been modeled to them. And so we always need to look to Jesus because we'll, we can, we can uh, take on a wrong mantle. We can take on something that God never intended. And so in Matthew 20, 28... It says, um, let's go up when Jesus was talking to his disciples. Verse 20, and then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request to them. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and one on your left. But Jesus answers, he says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. And he said to them, my cup will you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand, on my left hand, this is not mine to give, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared by my father. On hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers, and Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be what? Your servant. Hmm. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, you see that, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom to many. Hmm. So number one is a humble servant. Philippians 2, 7, write that down. It says, Jesus emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men, right? And so uh, they're not driven by, driven by titles or prestige or honor. Jesus talked about them in Matthew 23, those that wanted the best seats and the, the best whatever, the best stuff, right? He said, no, he said, I didn't come for you to wait on me. I came to serve you. Jesus demonstrated it when he wrapped a servant's towel around his waist and he sat down and washed his disciples' feet. That's a sign of what? Pure humility right there. Washing feet. He did all of those things. Why? Because he was demonstrating what the apostolic looked like. Mm. You don't see a lot of that today. All right, let's tell the truth. We've made, and yeah, I'm on live stream, but we have made the apostolic and the prophetic, we have made it uh, celebritized and glamorized. It's not the true, it's not authentic, okay? All right, it's a form, it's a model, but God's tearing that down, right? And so Jesus said, look, it's to serve, See, an, a, an authentic apostle understands Galatians 2.20 that says, I have been crucified with Christ. <laughs> and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. There you go. Paul understood it. Read his life. Right? Yeah, that's the, the nature of a servant. So that tells me if we're a true apostolic house, that anointing of serving should flow down, and it does. That's why we have servant leadership, right? Yeah, it flows down. So you, you should have the nature of a humble servant, and you should be serving in the house of the Lord somewhere. Yeah, put your hands to something. It's going to get on you, especially all these new folks coming in. They're going to get it. Mm -hmm. You can't help it. <laughs> Because God will, will make sure you get it. The second thing God spoke to me, apostles are focused on the Jesus mandate. Go to Matthew 28. Okay, they're focused on that. 
You hear me all the time talking about Jesus, how Jesus, the kingdom of God, right? You hear me all the time preaching the kingdom. Why? Because it's a mandate on my life. I love to preach the kingdom. So Matthew 28, 18, this is, this is the great commission. It says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated and they saw him and they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. So the mark of an authentic apostle is authority. That's another one. You can write that down. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Amen. That is a, a, the Jesus mandate. Go to Mark 16. Mark says it like this. See, this is what, this is another uh, mark for you. Mark 16, 15. It says, and he said to them, you know, he appears to the eleven themselves, and they're reclining at the table, and he he. Uh, reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him that Jesus that he had risen. So Jesus shows up and they're all reclining and he rebukes them. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You see that? He said, he who believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has not believed or who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if, if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's the Jesus mandate or great commission. I read it in two places that you will see an apostolic or an apostle will be about the mandate of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That will be a big, huge focus for them. Right. And the mandate, that mandate is for for you personally in your personal life. Many of you have already gotten delivered. You've gotten healing. There's many things taking on in your life. Right. So it's for you personally, it's for us corporately, and abroad. And we see that, what, other nations? Yeah, it's, it's how it works. And I'm going to tell you, the fullness of this, the fullness of the, of the apostolic uh, mandate or the commission of Christ comes when we begin to step outside the confines of a local city and go to the nations. I'm telling you what, when we stepped foot in Kenya, something happened to me. Why? I didn't need that here. See what I'm saying? But but the mantle is there, but when I step out into foreign soil or go into other regions, there is something which is Jesus, the commissioning of Jesus just falls. And it doesn't just fall on me. We're a company of people. You should be going to new heights. If you don't want to, it's because you're resistant, okay? And so when we go out, that's when the fullness comes. I tell you all the time, you know, in here it's equipping and training and all of that imparting to you. But when you go out, you should see something happen. Yeah, you should see something happen in your life. If you choose not to walk in fear, but walk in faith and know who you are. I know sometimes Deborah will tell me that she prays for people in Walmart too, you know, and they get healed and stuff. What is it? Praise the Lord. What? She's using her function and her gifts outside the church. And so, you know, you say, well, God doesn't use me in there. And I don't, how come you're not doing nothing? It ain't God's fault. It's yours. We done commissioned you how many times? You know, we keep commissioning and commissioning. Go therefore, right? Go. Why? Because it's in you. It's in you to do that. And the next mark of one is the pioneering spirit. Okay? And so it says what? Go into all the world. Go to Luke. And many of you will go to nations. You know, you'll be going to the nations with me. God will tell you when it's time. And I'll know when it's time. And, you know, that's see, that's a training center. You know, that's what we are. People start and they begin by what? Being an intercessor. 
praying, learning how to hear God's voice, knowing that they're hearing, building up their confidence, being faithful to serve. And as they continue to do that, God says, okay, now go ahead and take them with you. And he'll be talking. He'll be telling us, you know, now it's time. You know, and then they, and you just begin to grow. You grow spiritually. But if, I, but if, because remember, apostles are under the headship of who? Jesus, right? Yeah. And so if... If I don't ever, if I'm a, a controlling or insecure leader and I don't allow you to exercise your gifts and your abilities, I'm stunting you. That's not authentic. An authentic apostle is an equipper and a trainer and a reproducer and a sender. Okay? All of those things should be happening. Now, there's greater dimensions of those, uh, those things operating in here, but it's going to get greater as we mature together. Let's, let's just tell the truth, right? And so we're all maturing in this. Amen. That's why we have people come in. That's why we connect to people. It's because no one has everything. And so as, you know, it, as we uh, mature in areas and we get strengthened and sharper in different areas, you receive it too. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. And so Luke 9, verse 1, he says, And he called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over the demons and to heal diseases. That's, there's your mark right there. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. So we are a house. We do these things. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff nor a bag nor bread nor money. Don't even, he said, Do not even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Mm -hmm. Departing, they, he says, and then they begin to going out into the villages and doing what? They were told to do. And so I'm talking about pioneering here. Jesus released power and authority. The directive came from Jesus. And so when people call and they say, uh, Apostle, we want you in uh, different places, different cities, churches, I don't just always say, okay, I'm coming. No, I got to hear the Lord because he's going to release power and authority to me and he's going to send me to places. Amen? And so I, have, I don't want to go places where I'm not sent by God just because I carry authority in certain regions or areas, I have to know, and we'll talk about that later in the month, but I have to know what place, where to go and where God has sent me. I don't want to go without being sent. Neither should you. Don't take on another man's spirit or assignment. Mm. Luke 10, it's in verse 1, it says, Now, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others. You see that? He sends out his 12, and then they come back with a report, and he, said, and he brings in 70 more. And he sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. And he says, look, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. And he repeats himself again and tells them the same thing he told the original ones. And so I love this because Jesus appointed them. The calling on your life is not from a man, it's from the Lord, okay? He appointed them, and then he sent them ahead, and you notice he said he sent them to every place where he himself was going to come. <laughs> and so um, the apostles get their directives from the Lord, okay? And so the, the, uh, um, they go into all the world according to the grace given. Jesus expands the regions to them. God does it. And then it was what? To bring glory or to say it to, to Jesus, right? So apostles get their directive from him. Apostolic is a, uh, it's also a mantle of strategy. So many in here have been getting what? Strategies on your life. Your eyes have been opened. Your, your God is speaking to you. Revelation has been released. There's some strategies God is giving to you concerning business because it's not just limited to the church. Business, marketplace, different things, your families, right? And so this strategy is capable to conquer territories, 
personally taking ground through deliverance and corporately with regions to establish um, disciples and churches for Christ. That's it. That's what it's all about. Okay? It's to what? Advance a kingdom. Okay? That's why people say, man, you're a busy house. Yeah, but we have the grace to be busy. <laughs> but we're not just busy about stuff. We're busy about what? Our Father's business. Amen. Amen. The fourth thing, apostles have a mantle of adversity. Hmm. We don't like to talk about that one. Revelations 12, 11 says that they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. Oh, Lord. Yeah, and so apostles are overcomers. They go through great adversity. Paul wrote about it. He talked about being shipwrecked out. He talked about, he had a list of things in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 6, that whole chapter. He was saying, look, I'm validated. He said, you don't believe that I'm validated? Look at my life of adversity. And I'm still preaching the kingdom. I'm still in love with Jesus, right? I haven't pleased man. I haven't threw in the towel. I just quit. This is too hard. <laughs> he didn't do any of that. Why? Because he had an overcoming. He had, a, he had an overcoming spirit. So you have it too. Praise the Lord. Yeah. It flows on down. Many of you have overcame so much. Why? Because God, that anointing is on you to overcome. And Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, 9 says, a wide, this is what Paul said, a wide door of effectual service has been opened to me, and there are many what? Adversaries. Yeah, so sometimes people get confused, and they think because uh, the work is hard or because people are always attacking them that they're doing something wrong. It is a test, okay? You have to. Jesus the apostle was despised and rejected of men. Men of what? Many sorrows. That's what Isaiah says. It's the truth, right? So why should we think, or why, you know, why should we think that we won't go through some things? So Jesus the apostle went through great persecutions. He went through what? Accusations. Jesus was casting out devils. He never did one sin. I mean, we've been washed by his blood. If people come against us, we probably did it somewhere. Jesus did nothing wrong, okay? He, and he, did, he was perfect. And yet they said, you know, you're casting out demons by demons. And you're, you know, all this stuff. And just constantly mocked and ridiculed Jesus. But you know what? He set his face like flint, and he finished his, what, assignment. Yes, he did. Hebrews 5, 8 says he was a son who learned obedience by the things he suffered. And so authentic apostles will not always be spoken well of. Oh, you expect that the other side. Well, I'm here to tell you, you will be mistreated. Okay? We know that. They will be tested by the fear of man you will get this test. The fear of man, the praise of man, and the love of man's influence. Mm -hmm. And so those are some tests that you must pass. It says they are present led by Holy Spirit, not by the plan and, per and pressure of men. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an apostle has to do that. But guess what? You're an apostolic company of people. I'm going to say it again. You will be tested by the fear of man, because we're not to fear man but God, right? The love of man's influence, the praise of men. So that tells me as, as God is promoting you, okay, you're gaining authority because that's one of the marks of an apostle is authority. So you're gaining authority. You're getting revelation, all of that. You will be tested, okay, in these areas. Are you going to be pressured by man to perform? Hmm, 
Or are you going to be led by who? Holy Spirit. Because people will pull your chain every which way. But you have to be led by Holy Spirit. And when you get promoted, can you take the warfare? You know, even if you get a new car, you got new warfare. Oh, yeah. Get a new house and see if you don't get warfare. Get a promotion on your job and see if you're not hated and jealousy and envy comes at you. Uh Uh-huh. I'm telling you. But you have the grace. All right? John 6.64 says, But there are some of you, Jesus is saying this, There are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who was, uh, who they were who did not believe, and who who it was that would betray him. And so, in the an apostle will have Judas, will have Judas's in their life. Why? Because you will be tested by Judas concerning your love walk and your love for Jesus and people. Your love walk will be tested by Judas's. (laughs) Oh, yes. And so that's a mark, though. That's one of the marks. The next thing, number five, apostles will be tested in their character and integrity. And we know that. Um, They endure greater testing in this area because God has to refine and break them. And so Hebrews uh, 4.15, I don't think I read that one yet. Help us, Lord, to get it. Yeah, that's why you need to pray for your leaders. Please pray. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. (laughs) And so therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so when he's saying that, they, we have to learn to walk in repentance and under the blood of Jesus, okay? We, have to, we, we know we're going to make mistakes. Just because you know, you're an apostle doesn't mean you're perfect. You're still a person, and you still mess up, but you understand that you do have an overcoming. You, you're an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb. So you keep yourself walking in repentance and under the blood of Jesus. But you will, you will endure greater testing. They endure greater testings in that area. And number six, um, apostles are called to walk in great faith. Okay? Why? Because they have to pioneer. They have to endure all these things. And so they have a creative ability to take little and multiply resources. You say, well, how can they do that? Well, we've been doing it, ain't we? And not only that, Jesus, what did he do with, with a basket of lunch? Jesus could multiply, couldn't he? He, brought, he released increase with a small lunch. He fed thousands. And so they, and a, a true apostle will be a giver and not a, a taker. They will not fall into mammon. They will be tested in the area of finance, that's for sure. But lust and greed with uh, lust, greed, and money. And so it has to always be about souls. If you, uh, the, uh, the apostolic will always be about souls. Remember the Jesus mandate. That's more important than what you're looking at right now. It's souls. It's always going to be about that. And, And even more important than what? Image. Imagery. It's more important than that. And so, seven, they are focused on kingdom building, okay, personal within, corporately, through strong families and ministries. And so, they also release, and we have that in here, they release uh, entrepreneurs into the marketplace. See, the old way was always about the church structure, but today, thank God, he's expanded, you know, it's not the gospel. It's not just about me. It's about multitudes. It's about nations. And it's also about um, Jesus ruling in every mountain, right? We, we, we teach that stuff in the marketplace, all those places. So in the marketplace to rule and create wealth to establish the covenant because we know you got to have resources to fund the work. you got to have resources to feed people. Amen? You gotta have resources to do that. And so they are builders. They they are blueprint 
builder. You hear sometimes, many times, uh, when we go out, we'll get prophetic words from other what? Apostles and prophets that speak and say these things. You're blueprint builders, you're equippers, you're a trainer, you're this, you're that. Why? Because he, God keeps confirming who we are. We don't have to apologize for that. Never apologize for who you are in the kingdom. Don't ever fall into that, okay? And so, number eight, apostles invest in souls. They are not afraid to invest in the lives of people. They have a heart. They have the heart of Jesus for souls. Uh, an authentic apostle will have equal opportunity amongst the brethren. Amen. That means there's no gender, no ethnic, no social status or hierarchy in those areas in the kingdom. They understand that the greater one is what? Within you. And so that strips off limitations. And so an, an apostle will take limitations off of you. And we've done that with many coming in. They'll take the limits off. They get you out of an old mindset because they're blueprint builders, right? They'll be able to, by the spirit of revelation, look within you and say, I see that. There's a gift in there. There is, there is this potential in this person and they'll be driven to pull that out of you and to get you working in the kingdom. Thank God. And so they understand that. Apostles have an anointing to identify and pull out of me. George and I, um, years in, you know, spirit-filled churches and stuff, but I'm telling you, when our life changed, our life did change when we connected with the apostolic prophetic. I'm telling you, something came alive in us. Yeah, why? Because that's what we needed. We had some pieces and we had some things, but when we connected with that prophetic flow and that apostolic anointing, man, we, came, we went to a whole other level of what? Revelation understanding. Now, what if we chose to resist the apostle? To resist that, and we hung and we hold on to traditional teachings that we were taught, we all wouldn't be here today. And some of you will probably still be bound up, chained up, unless God sends somebody else to you. It's true. Yeah, I'm telling you, thank God for the gifts, right? Lord, help us. And so we have an anointing to identify and pull those things out. So the gift of God and uh, the gifts of God, and we activate it. Apostles, speak to your potential, not your current situation. So sometimes people will come in and they'll be, you know, um, kind of whining, you know, and just you just don't know what I'm, you know, going through. What what's you just apostle? You don't. I'm like, uh, uh no, we're not gonna listen to that. Why? Because. We have to get you out of that. We know where you're going, and we know what's in you, the potential and the Spirit of Christ in you. Amen? And so sometimes it can come across, if, if uh, apostles can come across being hard or mean or, you know, too militant. No, it's an anointing that's needed in your life. Because if you didn't have it, didn't, you wouldn't do nothing. You'd be lazy, right? And so apostles are equippers. We said that. So apostles are cross-cultural multi-generations. Look around. Thank God. We cross cultures. We can Multi-generational blessings are released through them. Number nine, they have a passion to see God's people whole. And so don't say that you're an apostle and you cannot cast out a demon. Come on. Or you won't cast out a demon. Or heal the sick. Right? All those things. And so they're about to see, they're, they're a, they have passion to see people well. In um, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, it says the signs, Paul said, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with perseverance, <laughs> signs and wonders, and what? Miracles, miraculous power. And so they, they did all of those things. They demonstrated. it. And number 10, they always, they glorify Jesus at all times. Go to Acts 4. And so you'll see that they're always going to take you back to Christ. They'll counsel with you, whatever, and they're going to take you right back to Jesus. Uh-huh. They're going to say, hold up here. Let's see what Jesus has to say. How did he act? How did he function? 
In 4.13, it says, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Amen. And so you'll see them. That's how you demonstrate. Jesus says, you know the tree by its fruit. You will see them begin to think, talk, and do the deeds. And their life will always bring glory to who? Jesus. I remember uh, one of the words that I got uh, a couple times, and it said that you, you'll always give God glory. God said, you will always give me the glory. It's the truth, because I know that we can do nothing unless he does it through us. I know it. There's nothing good in these earthly tents except the power of God. Right? I can't do it on my own ability. See, Jesus said, what? You're, you're supposed to be humble, become like a little child. Well, a little child needs their mother, right? Needs their father. They need that. And so when you st continue to stay humble, when God is giving you more understanding, giving you more, um, you see an increase in that anointing. You see an increase in your life. You better stay humble. When men start patting you on the back and telling you how good you did, you better give God the glory. For real, not false humility. You got to recognize that because that is a door for the enemy, for pride to come in. Thank God. So we we understand something, and there there'll be some more things. I am going to close with this uh, sheet here, and I'll hand it out to you. I want to read this to you, and this will be. Uh, I got this out of um, oh Joseph Matra. Excellent. I, I post a lot of his articles because I really love that man. I, I don't know him, but I know him by the Spirit, you know. And so apostolic versus pastoral, okay. Pastoral preaching, you can hand them out if you want to. They're right there. Pastoral preaching is therapeutic. Apostolic emphasizes personal commitment in spite of how you feel. How many times you hear me say that? It ain't about your feelings. It's about what did God say, right? You're not going to get therapeutical stuff. I'm not going to sympathize with pity. Not going to do it. Why? Because we can't do it. This hour, time is short. Pastoral preaching emphasizes inward health. Now remember, when I'm saying this, these things are important. I don't want anybody leaving here thinking I'm saying the pastoral is not important. Oh, yes, it is. Okay, it's a five-fold, right? But I want you to see the difference here. Pastoral preaching emphasizes inward health. Apostolic emphasizes external tasks. Hmm. Pastoral preaching emphasizes our call to understand our true self by thoughtful observation. But apostolic emphasizes our commission to make God known by penetrating the culture. What did Jesus do? He was a friend of sinners. Right? How many times we keep telling you, go get them. Build relationships. Why? So we can pull them in the kingdom. <laughs> you don't go out to conform to them. No, we want to bring them up. Jesus, when he sat down and he ate with them, he wasn't, he wasn't joining in with that stuff. No, he was pulling them out. He, went, he goes and sits by the, the well with the Samaritan woman who he was not supposed to talk to. Right? And what did he do? You know, she, she went out and, and became an evangelist and said, come see this man. This told me everything I ever did. And so what did he do? He ministered to her life. And if he showed her everything, talked to her about her life, Jesus went all the way back and dealt with some things in her life. Right? That's what you're to do. Hello? Pastoral preaching is essential for a healthy church. You see that? But apostolic is necessary for a Christ-centered city. Why do you think God is allowing us and we're crossing and we're going to these places locally and we're, we're um, visiting and we're, you know, have other ministries now connecting? And I'm telling you, be, not because of any uh, special thing about George and I, but it's an anointing. And so as they begin to come in and they connect, there's going to be a grace released to these ministries and they're going to begin to prosper. <laughs> God is so good. Why? Because it's Jesus. 
Okay? It's Jesus. Pastoral preaching aids us in self-discovery and recovery. But apostolic promotes societal transformation that can lead to restoration of God's kingdom principles on earth as it is in heaven. See, we're, we're talking about releasing the kingdom. All right? Yeah, we want you well. That's why we do the inner healing. That's why we do deliverance. But we want you get to get well so you can go and do something. <laughs> and so, oh, help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Pastoral preaching emphasizes relational stability. Very important, right? Apostolic assembles the saints in purposeful unity to fulfill the Great Commission. Jesus' mandate, like I said earlier. Pastoral preaching emphasizes self-renewal. Apostolic preaching emphasizes personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. It'll keep the fire under you to move. I'm telling you, if you don't have the fire under you, you're going to camp out right there around a little campfire, but it needs to be under your bottom so you can go do something, right? Because we have a responsibility. Remember, Jesus said what? Too much is given, much is required. And so if much has been given to you, a uh, pastor had got a word a while back, a long time ago, I remember it though, but it says those, those folks have teeth. What's that mean? That means that you, you can eat some meat, and you eat it, right? Much is given, much is required. That means you have a responsibility. That's why you hear me say that all the time. What are you doing? What you got your hands to? Who got saved or healed this week out there? Mm -hmm. Pastoral preaching is inward focused and promotes counseling strategies for the sheep. Very important. We have mappers, and we're raising up a very strong uh, counseling center. I love it, and I'm excited about it. But we're not stopping counseling them. We know that. Apostolic emphasizes outward focused and promotes evangelism and making disciples of the nations. So we counsel to get them whole and well and delivered and infilled and activated to go out and do. The pastor is sent to counsel the apostle to lead and conquer. Every person needs a pastor. Yes. All people groups need an apostle. Very true. Every apostolic leader needs a pastor, and every pastor needs an apostolic leader. You see that? See how that works? Yeah. So who's more important? It's all important. <laughs> That's what I want you to see. We don't, we don't say, well, we're apostolic sinner uh, pridefully. That's just who we are. That's who God created us to be. And so when people begin to ask you, you know, what, it, you know, what does that mean? They've been asking. You need to be able to give them a good answer. You need to be able to tell them what, who we are and what we do. Okay? Why? Because it's on your life. Mm -hmm. And you can experience greater dimensions whenever you do that. Amen. In Matthew 16, in closing, for real. Ha <laughs> ha. This is the last one. <laughs> I get excited about it. Why? Because I want you to know who you are. In Matthew 16, 18, I say to you, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You see that? Now, some of you have heard this years ago. I talked about that, but when he's talking about his church right there, that's that word ecclesia, okay? Governmental body. That's what he's saying. He's, he's not talking about a, a, a little baby, you know, church with a milk bottle. He says... And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Haiti will not overcome it, right? And so there is uh, an authority on God's, uh, on God's church, on his government and body that has authority. And we'll talk about all that another time in, in the gates, okay? And different gates and different realms of authority and influence and all of that. So, man, that's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, that's who you are. That's why you're overcoming. That's why you, you go through adversity, but you don't stop. Yeah, you can do it. The, the greater one is in you. And so you're, and I'll say this too, 
when you do have, and you learn exercise gifts in that, but I'm telling you, when we have found that, you know, when people, when you connect to God's order like that, and you begin to connect your gifts and your anointing, your authority goes to a whole nother level. Because all they're doing is pulling, the anointing draws out of you what's already in there. It's a discovery. It's a, a revelation that is revealed to you by, by God. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, God is good. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your people today. I just thank you, Father, for greater understanding, Lord, of the apostolic. And we know there's so much to it, Father. And even as we continue, Lord, I ask that their eyes be open, even in the marketplace, on the job, all these places where they go, Father God, at school, that they will see what is resting upon them, Father. And I just decree and I declare that the revelation begins to get activated, Father God, and it begins to produce great fruit in their life. And I just release blessings over them and let them have a word to speak to those that ask them who they are and what is this place about, Father, that they can um, give a right word to people. And we just give you glory for it and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name.